There's all the classic stats around 90% of startups fail, 70% of those fail in years one to five, which is our sort of sweet spot. Looking back at the clients we've worked with, only 3% of our clients have closed down. If we can be part of the solution that reduces a 90% failure rate to a 3% failure rate, that's us creating value for New Zealand. 3% of your companies have failed in that first five years. That's huge. I shit you not, I hear about you guys all the time. The ecosystem wraps you guys hard. If you're a venture-backed SaaS company in New Zealand, if you're not using oxygen, you probably have the wrong solution. Like 100% I believe that. How do you work with founders? Do you have an approach? Often with our clients, we are the only person that sees the real picture other than the founder. I've had many meetings with clients where they're in tears and you've got to find a way to help them. Tech's on track to become the biggest exporter of New Zealand by 2030. What tech exporting is, is it's taking the smarts out of our smartest people, putting it into code and selling it to the world. And how much better is that than milking a cow? Kia ora. Thanks for tuning in to the We Fucking Love Startups podcast, brought to you by Talent Army. When you set up Oxygen, what, what did you want it to be? Um, when I very first started um, my career, I guess, I left um, Otago Uni as a, an accounting graduate and did what accounting graduates do, which is get a job in a big accounting firm. Yeah. And in my second week at PwC, I rang my dad, who used to be an accountant as well um, originally, and was like, oh my God, I hate accounting. <laughs> and I've got an accounting degree and I'm in the world's biggest accounting firm. Um, what do I do? And he said, oh, look, you can't quit your graduate job in your first year. It'll just look... Yeah. look bad in your CV and you know, all that sort of stuff. What was, it, what was it particularly that you hated? I hated that all the work you were doing, especially to me at the time, I was young and I was impatient, but a lot of the work we were doing felt like you were doing it just to tick a box. Well, there were two purposes. One was to tick a box um, to do year-end accounts for people who had no interest in the numbers you're preparing. It was just to do a tax return. You're yeah. giving their numbers nine months after the end of the year. They don't even look at it. Um, so that was the first purpose. And the second purpose was to save some really wealthy people a tax yeah. payment. Um, and neither of those really resonated with me at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I just, yeah, I just didn't feel excited about that. So, yeah, I spoke to my dad and he said, look, you can't quit your job in your first year. So I took that on board and I quit on my first year anniversary. <laughs> um, actually to join who I think is a guest later today for you, is Derek Hanley. Yeah. Um, so I joined the Hyperfactory uh, startup. The OG startup, man. Yeah, one of the original startups in New yeah. Zealand. Yeah. Um, and within a week of starting there, I suddenly realised, hang on, I don't hate accounting. I love accounting. Yeah. I love accounting when there's a purpose behind it, uh, when you're creating numbers that people are using to make better decisions. Yeah. And yeah everything you're doing has a purpose and people are stoked with the numbers you're giving them and they're like oh my god i didn't know this yeah and suddenly they're making better decisions around hiring people or restructuring or going into new markets or whatever it is suddenly you're preparing information that helps them run a better business Mm. so So for people listening right now right there's there's probably mostly i would say most of them aren't finance people yeah you know um some of them are what is it that a really good finance CFO person unlocks in a startup? Like, talk me through, what are, what are they unlocking for startups? Yeah, so the very first thing I think, the most important thing for all startups is their cash position and their cash flow forecasts. And understanding what is the impact of their decisions on their cash flow. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously looking backwards is relatively easy. The numbers are there, it's presenting numbers in the right way. And there is a lot there as well around unit economics and presenting that numbers in the right way. But the very first thing that almost all our clients want to know is when do we run out of money or do mm-hmm. we run out of money? Yeah. So it's helping them understand um, here's your cash flow forecast if you hit your revenue targets, things like that. Yeah. But also what happens if you don't close that contract that you've been talking about for three months? What happens if you have a slow month? What's the snowball effect of that on your recurring revenue? Mm. Um, or the vice versa. Actually, what happens if you grow faster? Can you hire more people? What are the triggers that you know when can you hire? Because without that information, they're just sailing blind and they're just having to make those decisions off the cuff. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes that works. 
Um, but sometimes it's most times not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Often I'll, not. I'll call it. Yeah. <laughs> so you can then go back to Hyperfactory, right? So you yep. find yourself at Hyperfactory, which yep. was like for people that are young and listening to this, you yep. know, like Hyperfactory was like building the coolest shit before there was even like iPhones, right? Yeah, like exactly. Mobile devices and yep. stuff. So it was doing digital media before like with Nokia's yeah. um, like websites, yeah. which people don't even know about these days, but it was literally the internet on phones. We used to have this phone that phone. all you could do was play Snake and call yep. people. Yep. Yeah, and you guys were doing some cool <laughs> stuff on it. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Ringtones, yeah, <laughs> that was a big one. <laughs> yeah. And so, so tell me there, like, so what was it that you're like, all right, I'm in Hyperfactory now and yep. this is what I'm meant to do. Was it just the like advisory that you felt like you were a part of the business? Yeah, exactly. And so it was pulling together information around, um, originally a lot of the team were looking at the information and saying, we've got these really big name clients, like we had clients like Coca-Cola and Toyota and um, Disney. We'll be making heaps of money with those clients yeah. and they were paying bigger invoices. Um, but they had this long tail of smaller clients that they'd just been ticking away in the background. Anyone assumed that that was the sort of lagging uh, work that they weren't making money on. Um, and one of my very first jobs when I joined there was helping do an analysis on which clients were profitable, which ones weren't. And really quickly we realized, actually we're losing money on these big names mm -hmm. and all the profit we're making is on these small clients, which is a perfectly adequate strategy, having big uh, flagship clients that you make a loss on to attract a smaller mm -hmm. client base, if that's intentional. But at the time that wasn't intentional. That was, uh, everyone assumed we were making money on these big clients and we we're like reluctant about the work they were doing on the small clients. So that's just one example we can start using finance an analysis to look at historic information and start figuring out what parts of the business are doing well mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. And that was that was the very first project I did when I joined there and straight away you could see people's faces when they were like, huh, You're that's just unlock interesting. Unlocking things for yeah. people, right? And yeah. straight away the decision making process they're going through, whether it's just on the floor or at the board meeting or whatever, um, suddenly they're making better decisions because they got better information. So when I, when Derek comes on later, I'm going to ask him, what was the key moment? Was it? <laughs> <laughs> and then was it was it then that you knew, all right, this is it, I've got the startup buzz yeah, now? Yeah, straight away. Oh, even before that, I've always loved startups. Even when I was at high school, I was always doing Young Enterprise Scheme. Yeah. Um, I was actually in a Young Enterprise Scheme with another former client of yours, Tim Boyle. Oh, um, yeah, so nice. we were, <laughs> um, and so right from when I was a kid, I was always looking for entrepreneurial was things. Was it undies? Was it the undie thing? No, it wasn't. No, that was... That was who did that after uni yeah. uh, we did um, it was actually called Ice Cubed Ice it was Cubed. a um, chili bin oh, nice, nice. <laughs> after Ice Cubed yeah. like was it were you guys little young rappers uh, Tim definitely thought he was yeah <laughs> 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 awesome. So you got the startup bug from school, found your way into a startup. Yep. And then did you know then what your career was going to be? I definitely knew then that I loved supporting decision making. Yeah. Um, and I loved the vibe of startup. And going from a big accounting firm into a you know 50 person company where decisions are made on the fly and things are moving really fast and having information really quickly is key. Yeah. Suddenly I knew I was in my place. And yeah, I knew from then that I was, that was my path. Awesome. Hey, so before we get into oxygen then, maybe let's sort of start with a bit with your backstory as well, man. So like you, were you making undies, undies at high school as well? <laughs> oh, it's funny. It's really funny listening to Matt because we don't talk about this stuff that often. So it's funny diving back into it and there's quite a few parallels. And even what he's talking about with Hyperfactory, the stuff that he loved doing is the stuff we're doing now. So it's funny mm. like a one year out of uni grad was doing pretty similar stuff to what now oxygen 30 people for 100 startups does 30 people 100 startups holy shit guys like poof, yeah you know like that's awesome hey yeah yeah, yeah. That's, we love it, it. yeah <laughs> and especially when you see i'm not sure if you saw the gdp numbers that came out yesterday in terms of like SaaS and like the billions of dollars now that SaaS is worth and to be able to say shit man i've had something to do behind the scenes with that you know is such a cool you know like thing and obviously like zero and like to make up for a lot of it yeah but then there was like if you look down there was so many and like there was a bunch of your clients that i could see sort of down there so yeah, yeah. yeah there's definitely like a long tail of like success stories that no one knows about i think that yeah. there's tons of and and we see it firsthand right you see a company just growing like crazy hiring 50 people look going from nothing to 150 million in value in yeah. two or three years like it's you see how quickly you can create value and that's 
awesome. Yeah, man. Like, was it, I saw on that report you said Vet Radar. Oh yeah. Um, easy, easy Vet. Um, it was a, almost 100 million revenue last year alone. Yeah. And I'm like, shit, man. They'd like, I mean, Hadley's retiring now. I retired now and just flies around from what I know, <laughs> from what I know. But yeah. So what's what's your background there, man? Yeah. So I I started or well, I came out um at a university um into Fonterra of all places and started yeah. as like an M&A graduate there. Um, got my background in like an investment banking type of style. Yeah. Yeah. Um, loved the work, thought it was super interesting, but just really didn't like working at a company of 10,000 employees yeah. where a lot of people kind of come in for a paycheck. Um, and it's interesting as well, like talking back to always having a bit of a tech bug. I was looking through my emails the other day, Connor Archibald, who you, you guys have had on before, yeah. Uh, is a friend of mine and, and client um, tracks its client, but um, I have an email. I was searching his name in my inbox to try and find his an email from him, and my inbox is mixed with personal and work. And there's a personal email to Connor Archibald at Lightning Lab from 2015, um, with me like two years into my career at Fonterra applying to get into Lightning Lab because I was interested in tech. And so I do think there is something yeah. where people just like. And both, yeah, both Connor and I are obviously still in the space and love it. And so it's probably just a signal that if you're like, if you're passionate about it, you'll make a career here. And I think that that's yeah, part of, man. part of why I'm still, still here. What was it about? What was it about the industry that attracted you? Just, I think my, my dad was a, was an entrepreneur, but in different sort of space. So he's in manufacturing. He yeah. did the, it's massive grind. Like it's not an easy, easy way to make, make a living, but I loved like the kind of you you make decisions and you are kind of steering the ship and you move something over here and it can massively change the outcome yeah. um that's what i loved about it and then but also i didn't want to do what he was doing i like i didn't i knew that was really hard and then tech was this exciting a way to do that on massive scale a way you can do it from new zealand that you can have a global impact which is i think close it's very very tough in something like nuts and bolts because the scale is you just suffer from not being in a country with a lot of scale yeah. so yeah tech was just exciting and I was, I was yeah like two years out of university and thought it was amazing so yeah. um yeah that was that was the drive where did you go when you emailed connor instead of fun staying at Fonterra? where did you go uh I, I moved to london eventually yeah. um and worked at a travel tech startup as a head of finance there and that definitely I was like no way am I going back to a company that's not tech and so as yeah. soon as I came back to New Zealand I was looking for jobs in tech it's the, I'm on that the Facebook page that uh, the New remember. Zealand startup ecosystem group yeah, yeah, yeah oh there's a post from me somewhere back there um, being like oh does anyone know anyone looking for finance people in tech how would I find a job in that and like I stumbled into Matt somehow and like match match made and like that was really awesome yeah, well, it's just, it's kind of like synonymous, right? Like accountants, SAS, oxygen. Yeah. You know, it's like for me, it, you guys are the guys, you know. And so and I've met a bunch, you know, there's a few sort of virtual folks out there. But um, without doubt, you guys, the name you guys have earned in the industry is, is phenomenal. Yeah. And I do like to say how there's is a, I love diagrams, but a Venn diagram of accountants and tech startups. There's not a huge overlap in the middle there. Yeah, yeah. Um, accountants by nature... Um, and this isn't criticism, it's just by nature. A lot of accountants um, like to know what they're doing on workday one, workday two, workday three. They like structure, they like mm. processes, um, none of which comes with working at a startup. This is why I told you I don't recruit for accountants. <laughs> <laughs> because like trying to find really good, risky, like modeling, financial analyst brain people with yep. that risk appetite, you know, is, yeah. is hard. Yeah. And then trying to overlay that working with, um, some pretty blue sky thinkers <laughs> and trying to find the right balance between the conservatism that a CFO should have yeah. with the ambition that a founder has. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a lot of challenges there and that overlap of the accountants um, isn't massive. How do you work with founders? Like in terms of, do you come in as the, uh, do you have an approach? Because like I get phone calls from founders at 10 o'clock at night, you yep. know, like, and um, you both straight away, you're like, <laughs> yep, I know that. Um, and you know, they're just like still thinking and processing, right? And then they'll call me in and just ask me for advice. That I, and I'm like, man, I'm not even the right person to ask for this, but I can probably connect you at least. Yeah. And so you become so entrenched in their business. Yep. How do you, how do you keep the separation? And do you have like a, you know, good cop, bad cop approach or do you have like an advisory? Yeah. So one thing I think there is we've had to change a little bit. So when we were smaller, um, we were quite chaotic ourselves and that was quite intentional. We were working with chaotic clients yeah. and we felt like we had to keep pace 
and that involved you know answering calls at 10 o'clock at night and in weekends every client thinking that their problem right now is the most important problem there is yeah. and jumping on it and often it is but jumping on those and responding as quickly as you can and probably lacking a bit of process internally yeah as we've grown so we're up to a team of 32 33 people now we probably when it got to about 10 or 15 of us we suddenly like we found that that chaos, chaos wasn't working yeah, yeah. and we had to start finding ways to reign in that chaos yeah. and it's definitely a balance of how do we keep working at the pace our clients run at while not burning out our team while not mm. burning out ourselves and um but still delivering the work they need yeah um and that is probably still one of our biggest challenges to so be honest so give me all the feedback then that you found Jono can you take notes for me here <laughs> <laughs> because I burn out every six months you yeah know, like without fail yeah but um yeah it's like par for the course for me almost because yeah. recruiting yeah. so emotional right it's yeah. like yeah and that's the same as finance right because in finance often with our clients we are the only person that sees the real the real picture yeah. other than the founder yeah. and the founder can't go talk to their their team like how are we going to pay payroll in three weeks time yeah and like man this forecast isn't going to happen we've promised something to investors what do we do you know like mm. those are the questions where the founders like often you're with a founder and you're part cfo part counselor and like you know i've had many meetings with clients with they're in tears and you're like you know yeah. you've got to find a way to help them through this process how do you do that like because is it just I mean, I know how I do it, right? It's, I, so I would say I just have collective, the amount of years experience that I've developed in the last seven, seven to 10 years yep. is probably worth 30, you know, yeah. but yep. how do you feel about it? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you touched on the highs and lows and that definitely goes to that and it's really hard to sit with the founder and go through those challenges and not take it on personally. It's definitely probably one of the hardest things in our role, I think. Talk me through, I'm a founder, I'm three yep. weeks away from payroll. Yep. I don't have the money in my bank. Yep. I'm, I've, been, I've been telling you about this big deal that's going to go through, Matt, for like yep. six months, it's any day now, you know, like definitely yep. coming through and then it's not here yet yep. and I'm freaking out. Like, yep. Talk me through what you would do in that situation. Yeah, so often in that case, it's literally just, well, first of all, helping you with the test, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> stabilizing the conversation. Um, and going through the options and yeah. um, and in that instance almost always one of the only options they've got is going back to their shareholders um, founders are often hugely hesitant to do that mm. um, they're nervous about will they get the money but in these for most of our clients you know banks don't go near them especially in a situation this situation um, and adding debt to their balance sheet just isn't possible mm. so the only option often is going to those investors and having to get bailed out essentially yeah um ideally I, we haven't been through a situation where it's that bad and that unplanned for because a big part of our role is giving them that visibility not waiting until it's three weeks away yeah. and often it's you know a scenario planning and it's saying hey look if this deal doesn't come through you've got 12 weeks hey two weeks later you got 10 weeks yeah. you got eight weeks so it's not as if it's a surprise for them in that situation and we would be telling them 12 weeks out hey have these conversations with these shareholders early because they can't just rustle up money overnight yeah. um so our goal is that they're never getting that surprise in three weeks yeah. there have been times where that happens they've had money promised from a shareholder and the shareholder pulls out at the 11th hour that sort of thing um and we've had to have situations where we have to find an answer um, I was at Vend when that happened. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> not long after that, I wasn't at Vend. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and and that wasn't that's an interesting dynamic actually. That um, we go through these cycles with the market, and um, you have times where you're having heaps of conversations about how do we spend all this money? You know, yeah, 2021. That's what I was just going to ask you, right? And I might yeah. throw uh, throw it over you, yeah, like, because cool. that's another thing that I I see as a found like working with founders is they all of a sudden they raise money and then they're just like fucking time to spend a lot of water, right? Like, how do you then go in and say, right, guys, chill, daddy, chill? Yeah, I think in 2021, like, no one was even no one was telling them to chill. Even the board was telling them to spend more money, right? And yeah. the the environment is so much different now to what it was like then the board now if they are just plowing through their cash the board will probably be concerned as well and and i think most good founders know that that is like a lot of them having been through something like the the high of 2021 2020 to the lower 22 23 
they kind of know like I'm not going to get myself in that position again. Yeah. I think half my clients were in this exact position where they just plowed through cash thinking like we're just going to keep growing and we're going to raise more capital and that's kind of the cycle but that was a two-year anomaly not the not the norm mm. um so there is there's some strategy around it also as a finance person you want to see return right like like you are st we're still numbers driven we we are we describe ourselves definitely we're definitely not traditional accountants but we are we, our brains work that way we're heavily logic driven people and so when you look at a set of metrics and you, there's you watch as these like there's a whole lot of metrics especially in SaaS that you track but you watch them all into play with each other and so even if your growth is amazing if the rate at which you're returning your customer acquisition cost is poor or or you're like you look at your growth versus how much you're burning there's a few like rule of 40 or burn burn multiple those things yeah. I tell, like there's some like red traffic light signals going off like alarm bells start start ringing when the top line metrics look good but the other stuff is not looking good and, and you can actually you can forecast it right like you for us we they come up with a plan they figure out how they're going to spend their money we're like cool let's do that and let's look at how the metrics look over the th three-year forecast you put together and it's like oh this looks like terrible because you're spending 300 percent of your revenue on sales and marketing and that's actually crazily high like the, even for the most marketing led company that's crazily high and so it's just giving them arming with that information that a typical SaaS company in your position would be spending, I don't know, 30% of revenue. And you, and you have all those numbers? Do you have those, like yeah. the average, you know, marketing team? Sure. Marketing obviously always spends the most money. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. What would be, do you, do you know the term the Disneyland metric? So Disneyland has their metric, the amount of people in the park. And if they, if that amount of people in the park is at a certain number, every, nothing else matters. You know, like they're just making money and hand over foot. And so I always ask people, like, what's your Disneyland metric? What's the one metric, you know, that, that you sort of think about? Is there one that you think about when you're talking with SaaS companies? That you're like, this is the one that you really should think about the most? No, I actually don't think that. I mean, I think each client might have their own Disneyland metric, if yeah. that's what you mean. But I wouldn't say there's one Disneyland metric for all our SaaS clients um, because we've got such an array of SaaS clients where they might be B2C, they might be B2B, might be enterprise, you know, depending on what's their average revenue per contract. Um, so for each of our clients, it's different. It's different. Yep. And that's one of our goals is to help work with the clients, the, the, the founders, the directors, and understand what is the key driver for them. Yep. Um, and again, it comes down to how much cash they have in the bank. A um, whole lot of things come into it that will determine what is the most important metrics yeah. and I, even then i'd say very few of our clients would be so focused on one metric um like mike says i think probably the most important part is how do those metrics interplay with each other yeah. and um if you pour money into this section what happens over here and especially now in the capital markets where raising money is harder you have to have good unit economics and you have to find the right balance between like it an easy example is growth rates and burn rates. Mm. Um, you know, two or three years ago, it was all about growth rates. Now you have to have the right balance. Yeah. And so it's finding the right handful of metrics that all interplay with each other that show that you've got a good business. Yeah, it's interesting how like we talked about before, right? Like the last couple of years, the couple of years before the last couple of years, but like the massive the highs, now you've got some lows. Um, and so people that have found that a business over the last four years, you know, they've, they've been on a, <laughs> been through it all. Been on a roller coaster, you yeah. know, like I feel the few of us that have sort of been around since before GFC days and yeah. then after you feel like all right, you can you can kind of ride through this. But you you guys must have some clients at like extreme highs and lows, you know, that would have been challenging. Yeah, and it's interesting, like we, we touched on the last four years, but even going back further, when I first started working with New Zealand tech startups through Oxygen, sort of 2015, even looking back at what's happened since then, a lot of people focus on the 2021 20, bubble. Yeah. Um, but to me, it was like quite a, quite a steady yeah. pathway towards that. So when I look back at 2015, when I was first working with these tech startups in New Zealand, a big cap raise was $2 million. Mm. So one of my clients who I've been working with since then, I remember they raised $2 million. It might've been 2 million US. And that was like this massive success story. And everyone's like, wow, this is amazing. Um, now 2 million, like, and through that period, even up to now, like 2 million is, is like a seed round now. Mm, it's friends and, friends and family almost, right? Yeah, exactly, right? Yeah. 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 And we've regularly got clients raising five to 10 million. We've had half a dozen raise 20 to 30 million. Um, and so that's been a big shift in the market mm. that I think a lot of people are focusing on that, just that 2021 bubble. 
but yeah it's, it's a, just a different place from oh, i definitely felt it right like i would dan and i i mean i'm white hat dan's black hat right you know you, i mean you know dan right he's yeah. like i'm the most stupidly optimistic person that just runs <laughs> in, into something without even thinking and dan's like yeah. writing a business plan behind the scenes <laughs> with rope tied around me and so it seems to balance out really well between yeah. both of us because sometimes we'll we'll catch up and go yeah i, I think you're in the right here or, and let's move forward mm -hmm. but we were like even Dan and I were, were both saying, you know, to all our team from, I want to say 2018, 2019, this is not going to last. You know, <laughs> this is not going to last. Like things are really getting easier and easier and easier and it's going to come, it's going to come yep. back down. You're going to be prepared for it. But yep. um, I think even thinking that and knowing that that was going to happen, when it happened, I was still like, oh shit, <laughs> I didn't, you know, I wasn't ready for this. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's, it's hard. How do you deal with that as a services business though, right? That's like supplying all these startups and then going through all this and then you're behind the scenes saying, well, shit, we, you know, this is our business behind the scenes. How did you guys cope with it? That's probably when our clients needed us most as well, mm. when, when everything was turning to shit. So we were pretty hands on and just like getting stuck in like our clients, our friends, we care, like we've touched on it already, but we care a lot about the people we work with. And yeah. so like the first, we probably wouldn't even think about what it means for oxygen initially. I think longer tail, like we want to build a business here that is sustainable and so we can service and support more startups and have a bigger impact. Like that's, that's what we're fully driven by. Yeah. And so it does, we do have to bring it back to like, we need to make sure we make money here because otherwise we can't do all the good stuff we do. Um, but it's a balancing act. Um, I mean, it is a bit funny that some, like sometimes our clients are feeling things and really badly, like they're really struggling. Um, and we're in the trenches with them figuring out how they're going to get to the next payroll or whatever it is. But in, then other times they're venture backed and they're fitting out their office with like a $500,000 fit out. And we'd never, like, well, maybe not never, we have never been in the position <laughs> where we would be able to do that because yeah. we're revenue backed and we have to grow steadily and carefully. Um, so it's, it's just quite a different business to what our clients go through. Yeah. I'd say what's similar though to our clients and us is that we, we live and breathe tech and we live and breathe like high growth companies. And so we want oxygen to grow. Like there is a lot of people that would grow a business to the size that we have now and be like, cool, we'll pull back, we'll stop growing. Like we'll just reap the Easy rewards, now. right? Yeah. Because you you definitely make a lot more profit if you weren't trying to double in size. Um, yeah. But yeah, we want to have more impact and it's kind of like not, we're not here to sit back and um, just enjoy what we've got. We want to keep having more impact and doing more. Yeah. Yeah. Is that what you thought when you, you founded the business? Kind of fell into it a little bit in that a friend of mine had a startup and they were trying to raise capital and he reached out and was like, hey Matt, in your startup back in London, you had, you'd, we'd been through two cap raises. Um, we're pitching to K1W1 next week. Can you just have a look at our pitch deck? And so I was like, yeah, sure. So we went along and he ran me through his pitch deck and it was a great pitch deck, looked really nice but there wasn't a single number or dollar symbol in the pitch deck. And I was like, oh, that's really good, but um, I think you need to sort of highlight how much money you need, how long it's gonna last you, what you're gonna spend your money on. And he was like, well, I don't know any of that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, um, we'll just pull some numbers out of your financial model. He's like, I don't have a financial model. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, so, you know, did crash course with him, built out a financial model over the next couple of days, put some numbers in. And he was we like, laugh, but this is the truth no, across exactly, the board, yeah. right? Yeah. And he was like, oh, this is amazing. You know, I spoke to our accountants about it and they had no idea what, what I was even asking. I just asked friends and just no one really knew. Um, but this is exactly what we needed. Um, I've got some friends who need some help. Can you help them? And I was like, yeah, yeah, sure. So I helped their friends and um, they were like, oh, this is amazing. You know, we've got some friends who need some help. Can you help them? And I was just doing this for free at the time. Mm -hmm. I was just trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I was like, oh, maybe there's a, a business in helping startups. Um, so... That's when the oxygen first started, but for a couple of years, it was literally just me as a one-man band, basically consulting to yep. tech startups, um, which really married up my love of startups, my love of accounting with impact and purpose. Um, but I didn't really know where it was going to be going. And I kind of, in my mind, had two or three outcomes that might have happened. One was grow a bit of a business and work with five, six, ten startups, and one of those startups gets bigger and bigger, and eventually I just kind of move in-house there and yeah. and go with them. Um, a second possible outcome I'd kind of seen was getting to a certain size, similar thing, and then getting acquired by maybe a big four accounting firm or like kind of going in-house so we bigger. Yeah. Um, and then the third was, is there this opportunity to, to grow a business supporting startups? 
And was it ranked in that order? Um, I probably saw joining a startup as your finance is the most likely outcome. Yeah. Um, and to be honest, like, you know, it sounds bad given our job is to forecast, but I didn't really like, you know, yeah. intentionally didn't forecast what I wanted to do. Um, and so, yeah, so I'd been working with these early stage companies and um, got to about six or seven clients or maybe about 10 clients. And I had been selling, um, hey, I want to like help you do your capital raising, help do reporting to the board, help do cash flow forecasting, which is like in the accounting world is the sexy part of accounting. Yeah. <laughs> um, and more and more these clients were like, hey, this is great. But also, can Oxford Advisors do our payroll and our bookkeeping and do our GST yeah. returns? And some of those clients not even realizing that Oxygen Advisors was just me, like the smoke <laughs> and mirrors. Yeah. Um, and I was like, yeah, Oxygen can do that. And it'd be me at night, like figuring out how to do payroll in New Zealand and like <laughs> running payroll and doing that sort of thing. Um, and that obviously led to me getting busier and busier because I was yeah. trying to do this entire finance stack for about a dozen startups by this point. Um, and at that point, we had a, a a bunch of my friends said, "Hey, this guy Chris is moving back to New Zealand uh, from London. You guys should meet. He's he's trying to figure out what he wants to do." Um, so about five or six pe- different people all said, "Oh, you got to meet this guy Chris." Um, so I caught up with Chris for a coffee, and just straight away on the spot, I was like, "This is it. Let's yeah. do it." So he joined up pretty much straight away, yeah. um, and straight away we decided, "Let's make this a business," and started hiring. The right people for the right roles so started hiring and payroll bookkeeper people. payroll people yeah. and bookkeepers and management accountants um and i'm really glad i went through that process of doing the full finance stack you know i, I learned from top to bottom everything a startup needs to do for mm-hmm. their finances um but at the same time there is actually much better people at doing payroll than me much yeah. better people at doing bank recs than me um and so within about three years of chris joining we went from just being chris to a team of about 10 um mike mentioned he could just come back from london so uh we met mike seems to be your recruitment strategy wait for people to come back yeah. from london yeah pretty, pretty much good <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um bring that global experience back with you and, yeah. um so then mike joined um and yeah so then over the last two years gone or maybe three years now gone from um the 10 12 of us to 30 of us this is something i'm always interested in because dan and i have the the challenge that Talanami is Dan in Auckland, Talanami yep. is Troy in Wellington, right? And we're trying to build the team now around that and yep. profile the team. And there's probably way better people on the team than Dan and I these days, right? Yep. And how do you then how do you then bring like stop it being you guys? Yeah. Right? And it's been interesting going through that journey of just me to me and Chris to five to ten to twenty to yeah. thirty of us. And there have been these pivots through the way of changing that story. Um, both changing how we operate but also how we present that to the market yeah and so when i started oxygen a lot of the story was i'm at i've had my own tech startup i can help you raise capital i can do this yeah i can present your numbers to suddenly i had these clients who i'd sold i met to hey here's chris and they're like hang on who's chris yeah. and so having to change that story to we do this and yeah. and then also coming back i think it's tied quite tightly to that moving from that chaos. So the biggest problem with chaos, especially for an accounting firm, is then you have this massive dependency on key people mm. who have so much information in their head, and which is either about a client or about the way we do things, that I could do everything that we were doing, but the team were like, hey Matt, you gotta tell me what I need yeah, to do. Like, yeah. this is no use, like you know all this information in your head. So that was where we had to start reigning that chaos and creating the right processes to enable the team to be able to do that. Because like you say, we have got people on the team that are way smarter than me delivering work beyond what I can deliver, but it needed us to be able to reign in that chaos, have the right processes, have the right information flows and that sort of thing to be able to make that work. And when you're working with startups, they just want to work with people that they love and trust, right? And yep. so if they find someone and meet yep. you or someone, right, then they're like, all right, you're my guy now. Yeah. And then to like try and bring someone else and they're like, dude. Yeah. yeah. And that's, I mean, the other part of that is we are super intentional about who we hire. Yeah. Um, and so finding those right people internally to work for us or with us who understand startups, who can work with founders as well as being bloody great at what they do um you know we hire slower than what we could or should sometimes 
yeah. but because we're trying to hold out for those right people, yeah. uh, which has meant we've now got a team of 30 people that are just awesome. And lovely, man. Like everyone, like we well, obviously we've been in a few times now doing podcasting. There's lots of applause. There's lots of people, like people come in early, you know, it's like, it's, it seems like a good, good culture. Yeah. Yeah. And everything from the office space itself, like we want it to reflect more like working at a tech startup yeah. than working at an accounting firm. Yeah. Um, and you look at our journey of accounting, uh, of our offices, um, we've always wanted that vibe yeah. and um, through to, you know, we definitely don't wear suits and we, um, our setup is what probably if we walk in, you'd think we're a tech startup, yeah. not a accounting firm. Yeah, hundred percent. So then when did you know that you wouldn't run the company? Yeah. So that's a, that's a recent thing really. Yeah. Um, so just for context, um, I stepped back as CEO, um, kind of started working on this late last year yeah. and, um, officially stepped back on one April this year. So a couple months ago. Um, and appointed two co-CEOs, which is Mike and Chris. Pretty arrogant to hire two people to replace them, isn't it? <laughs> 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 I, that. I like it. It probably comes back to what you were talking about around those highs and lows. Yeah. And I've been doing this for nine years. And there's two elements to it. One is a positive spin and one is a probably more raw spin, which are both completely true. The positive side of the story is twofold. One is um, we had these two people in the business, Chris and Mike, who were doing fantastic work. They mm. both come on as shareholders, directors of the company. I could see them doing CEO level work beyond what I could do. Yep. Um, I think when I, well, definitely when I started Oxygen, I never saw having 30, over 30 people working here. Like I had never worked, well, I'd never led it was more of a, it seems like a really organic process, right? So you don't really plan it that much in your head, do you, when it's like yeah. that organic? Yeah. yeah, which is being a revenue-based company, you're able to do that. You kind of scale as your revenue grows. I had never managed teams at all. So I left PwC before I was a manager, so I, mm. I never went through that process of managing staff in a good, good structure. And then all my work after that was in early stage, high growth companies where there's very little, little structure mm -hmm. and I didn't have any direct reports like very flat structured businesses. Then when I started Oxygen, it was just me. Then for a long time, we were starting hiring people, but I had never really learned how to be a leader or how to manage mm. people. Um, and went through a number of definite massive growth opportunities for me, learning how to manage those people. Um, but I don't think I ever planned on leading 30 people. Yeah. Um, so then I had Chris and Mike here who were doing an amazing job leading the company both across the people leadership side of things, but the market leadership and all that sort of side of things, I could just see that they were gonna do a better job than what I could ever do. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to create that opportunity for them. And then the other half of the positive side is, as we've gotten bigger, I've spoken a lot about how we've needed to rein in the chaos more. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think there's this massive opportunity to do that even better. So obviously, AI is coming in and we've got all these opportunities to do processes better, either just doing them smarter with the tools we've already got or looking at ways we can do this more innov innovatively. I figured that there's no one better placed in the business than me, who I've done every job here yeah. for almost 10 years, right from doing bank and payroll through to raising capital for our clients to help craft that and do it intentionally and figure out the best way of doing it. Mm. So those those two reasons were really positive reasons why I wanted to step back from the CEO role and focus on oxygen and let Chris and Mike focus on leading the business. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, um, you talk about the highs and lows and working with founders and seeing the challenges they've got, but also having the challenges <clears throat> we have internally. Um, like all our clients, but also with us, 90% of the importance of a business is the people you work with, people leadership, going through those journeys with people. I have always been someone who takes that on board really personally. So if a client ever reaches out that something hasn't met their expectations, like, you know, it, I, I like can't sleep at night. I'm like, ah, oh, like I, I've take it on board really personally. If someone internally here at Oxygen, um, you know, you know, worst case, like someone quits because we haven't provided them with the right pathway or haven't set them up for success properly. 
again, I'm just like, I, I take it on board so mm. personally and I really struggle with that. So, um, and it's like, I think you're, when you're doing zero to one across 200 startups, right, yep. man, it's mentally and emotionally and physically taxing. Yeah. You know, like it's, I've aged more in, you know, the last couple of yep. years, <laughs> or the last 10 years than my whole life, right? And yeah. so, yeah, it's, I, am, I imagine, man, that you, like you, uh, just from knowing you, right, you're a zero to one go out of 100 yep. you know, guy. And so that would be pretty taxing, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's, you know, I could never switch off. I'd be on holiday in Fiji and I'd be logging into my laptop to, update a board report for a board meeting or yeah. logging into make sure payroll had been paid or, or whatever it was and I just couldn't switch off in the weekends at any time so more and more like this kind of accumulates yeah. and you spoke that you sort of go through these phases of like energy and burnout and energy and burnout and I was definitely feeling that I actually took a month off in 2022 for that reason just I would got to a point where I was just like yeah. broken and I just needed to find a way to to take some time out and that worked as a band-aid I think but then I came back after a month and I was just straight back into it yeah again running 100 miles an hour um you know the team often have a nickname for me which is mad woman just because I'm just like <laughs> running in every direction at yeah. every time every minute of the day and yeah and then it kind of like that month off provided a band-aid for six months but six months later like sort of mid 2023 I was just like kind of feeling in that state again I was like did you have a moment where you thought and I'll, I'll be I'll be honest and answer as well. Mm -hmm. I could just go and get a job, and that'd be so much easier. Like, how, well, I can tell you that I have that moment probably once a week, <laughs> <laughs> right? But um, but it doesn't last long because yep. I but I just allow it to happen every now and then. I allow myself to think. I mean, I, and I, I'll be like over ten years of telling I mean, I've had times where I've even looked at like job boards, right? And thought, yep. I wonder what I could do because I'm so burnt out and yep. I'm so drained. And then I'll get a dopamine hit of a client you know, that it's just really fun to work with comes in and I'm like, that'll top me up, that'll top me up. And then I'm, so I'm just constantly juggling my petrol tank, and, yeah. you know, emotions. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't think me looking at other jobs has ever been, like I've never thought as a solution to this in yeah. a job. Um, I haven't had a job for more than 10 years. <laughs> um, and so I don't think I could ever go back into a, like an employed job. Yeah. Um, for me, it was just like, like I didn't know the answer, but I was yeah. just like, I need to do something to get out of the cycle. So you probably got to like mid 2023 and I was just, I could, I wasn't at burnout at that stage, but I could feel it coming. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I started talking to a bunch of people about like, Hey, what, what options have I got? Um, and I was just really fortunate that at the same time I had Chris and Mike here who yeah. were already doing such great work that it was actually quite an easy yeah. like solution. What, how, how's it been for you coming in and working for a founder as the CEO? Because this this is something that happens in startups a lot, right? Like they'll bring in a person to be CEO. And I, I know that you guys knew each other pretty well before you took that role on. But still, it's challenging, man, when you're then uh, all of a sudden, or I'm the guy and, and he's sitting there staring at me and doing the <laughs> mad woman, whatever it was, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think you get a bit of benefit as well. Like, there's a bit of a mix, mixed bag. Like you said, me, Matt, and Chris have been working together for, like, I think it's like four and a half years or something mm. now. And so, and we make a lot of decisions as a three. And so, we had been doing things as a almost like decision by democracy, but it's easy when you're always all on the same page. And so, that, that really helped. Like, we've worked together a lot. I know. Do you still do that or do you? No, we've had to stop a bit because yeah. it's not that scalable, it turns out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the important stuff, we'll still do it. Like, we, when, when it's something that's a big deal we'll still all come together and we always are picking each other's brains like there's even with matt stepping back a bit we're still i still definitely use matt's brain often um yeah. because like he's been through he's been doing this much longer than me and there's a lot of experience for me to draw on but at the same time i want to bring my own style of might leave my own stamp what is that then what's the that's the new era of oxygen then what matt built before i was you know the five years before i joined um like it's fucking awesome um and i'm really proud of what we do and i think when it's your own work as kiwis and definitely matt's personality as well is like not to go and brag about what you're doing but mm -hmm. what we do is really fucking awesome i can outwardly say like we're the best like if you're a if you're a venture backs especially a SaaS company in new zealand like if you're not using oxygen you probably have the wrong solution like 100 percent, i believe that yeah. i think matt would probably not like he probably believes that um he probably wouldn't outwardly say it because it's kind of like bragging about the thing that you've done so i think that's part of what i'm doing is 
like yeah just being like trying to supercharge our like getting our story out there because i think to date 99 percent of our work comes from referral like we don't yeah. and that's awesome right like it's keeps our cac really low for all the SaaS people out there but yeah. um it does mean that we're we're probably not having as big an impact as we could have people will look at us on a piece of paper a board member will get a report and they're looking at a fractional CFO or something, they'll compare us to other options and they'll be like, oh, well, the other option is cheaper. And like, far I do not want to be compared on price because it is not apples for apples. Where else could you find a company that you could ask any single finance question about SaaS and you'll have the answer solved? Yeah, no, not like, in New Zealand. Yeah. Aunt, or probably like even we're launching an Aussie, it's oh, we haven't found, there is stuff in Aussie, but it's not, not like us, like yeah. not, not in tech. There are people who do it more broadly, but there's no one who really does it in tech like we do or, and lives and breathes the ecosystem like we do. And yeah. I think probably if you go broadly, like there's probably stuff in America, but not in New Zealand or Australia yeah. that I've seen. Yeah, I a hundred percent agree. A hundred percent agree. And so where, so where do you, so do you, like talk me through where you see the ecosystem growing and then how do you th like see the company growing yourself because of that? Do you need to continue the growth going to Australia do you need do you think how many more people do you think you could grow here in New Zealand comfortably with the size of our ecosystem yeah I mean I think the ecosystem is going to keep growing for sure and I also think we we have a pretty big impact like as we talk about 100 100 startups that we work with but it could be way more like I believe that there's heaps more of companies that we could be helping today that that are out there that probably just have like a subpar solution that we could be out there supporting so there's there's room for us to grow in new zealand but definitely the the decision to go to aussie was intentional we didn't want to like we do get we've i think we've turned away like six or seven inquiries in the last month that have been like oh i've got like a law firm um can you be our fractional cfo we yeah. don't really want to broad, uh, branch out into other industries because we're not like we're just not interested like yeah. it's not it's not where our passion lies we'd probably do a bad job we'd definitely be more similar to the other alternatives to us if we do that yeah. Um, and so we'd rather go to Australia where we can grow, like the market is obviously massive, like we, NZT helped us with a piece of work and the, like it was which city, Sydney or Melbourne should we launch in? And the, the outcome of the research was if you go to either one, they're bigger than New Zealand, the startup ecosystem in both is bigger. So you just, just pick. Yeah. Where'd, um, where'd you pick? Sydney. Yeah, nice. I think Sydney, like for me, I'm from Melbourne. And so um, Melbourne was where the ecosystem was probably longer, but Sydney's where it's like, at yeah. almost you know yeah so, i mean the buzz in sydney is awesome and like yeah we've loved it so far and the trips we go like when you go to surrey hills i just feel at home there you know like it's, I, it's, surrey hills is like a little startup yeah stub, suburb yeah, right? yeah it's so awesome it's um and yeah you're just like so many people like that i know i know are there and it's like i don't even live in australia i've not spent much time in sydney it's just yeah. that by virtue of being in the startup space a lot of people who we know and love are also there so yeah it's been what do you think the differences are between australian startups and new zealand startups now that you've sort of been exposed to it more uh like i probably look at it from a finance lens um like definitely they, they seem to bring in like a finance manager super early um mm. i think it's also a virtue of having way more capital available like the pool of capital in australia is so much bigger and deeper and it's been bigger and deeper for so much longer so they've had like their ecosystem is definitely, I think it's like 10 years ahead of ahead of here, which is exciting because you go to Surrey Hills and you're like, fuck, this could be us. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that they've they've had that benefit of good VCs and, and a lot of money being there for a longer time. And they've had the benefit of successes like Atlassian, Canva, Safety Culture, you yeah. name it. Um, and people coming out of those companies and creating more companies. So they've just had more of that um, that time of like compounding growth of the ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. tied to that is, um, is in New Zealand, it's getting better and better every year, but you know, three or four years ago, you could count the number of people in New Zealand who have exited a startup and are recycling both that capital and that knowledge back into the ecosystem. Yeah. You know, there'd be maybe five, maybe ten like of those people, the Derek Hanleys and the yeah. uh, those types of people. Um, whereas in Sydney, they've had the VC capital at a much higher scale for a much longer period of time, so they're into their like second and third generation or fourth generation of founders who have just yeah. been cycling that knowledge and capital through for so long. And that's just led to, you know, success upon success. Yeah, and yeah. I think New Zealand's on that journey. Um, it's just we're, we're a bit behind on that timeline. Oh, 100%. I think if we had smart, better VC money here earlier, you know, like if we had VCs investing in zero and other things earlier, um, I think it would have been, you know, different. But it's still an exciting, you yeah. know, time ahead of us. Yeah. Who, who should, like... If someone's listening to this, they're starting up a startup now or they're in a really mature startup, 
um, they might be thinking, oh, what stage should I engage with oxygen? Are they better for smaller? Are they better when I'm bigger? Raising capital is probably a classic milestone. It creates a heap of problems that we're really well equipped to solve. So you get a pool of money. You now have, you need to know how long it's going to last you. You want to try and access as much extra funding to make it stretch but usually you can't access that funding until you're spending money and then they also have professional investors who need high quality financials and then as well as all of this you're hiring probably like a team of 10 people and now you have to run payroll and you don't want to run payroll yeah. and it was already a bit of a, a ball like to to be doing your zero rex but now it's a lot more work and so all of that stuff we're really well equipped to solve so i'd say that's like the earlier stage if you raise a bit of money and you just need some support we definitely try and cater but even before raising money right like the planning that goes into the raising the money yeah i'd say for that first raise though you as investors aren't investing in a financial plan i do often get founders come to me being like we need a 10-year financial model for our pre-seed pitch deck and yes you do need to de demonstrate that you have a pathway to making money and a business model that you can defend but it, it is way more about investing in the founder, the idea, like probably your idea will change the way you're expecting this, like everything will change. So that the forecast, like as a savvy inv investor with like, as of someone with a finance background, I wouldn't put much stock in a forecast of a company that hasn't traded one day. Yeah. Um, so yeah, th I'd say in that very early stage, you, you want to raise capital on, on the back of yourself. Um, we do like often we get approached by founders who are in that early stage and like, I'll just have a call. And I'd say this happens once a month at least. We just offer some free advice, try and connect them with the right people, um, try and get them, like maybe introduce them to a VC or two or give them some advice around like, what's a, like, is this a crazy amount of dilution? I've been given a term sheet. Is this crazy? Um, we just do that for free. Because like, again, what, we, what is crazy then? What, like, can we dilution? just, yeah. Can, uh, we, can we talk about some of that stuff now? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, like you see some terrible, term I've seen, I mean, there's, there's startups that are almost 100% owned by VCs, which is like, like it's impossible to raise more capital if you do that, yeah. especially if you're still pretty early. So what should you defend then? Like, so say Jono and I have a media startup. Um, I don't know what it is. I can't think of a name off the top of my head, but, um, and then I'm going out doing some capital raise. We own 50% each now. Like what theoretically should I be giving away? It depends on how much money you're raising and age and stage. But like if in that very first round, you probably give a, it depends. Yeah. There's a few things. If you need to raise a lot of money, this will change, right? Like if you're a deep tech startup and you need to build a lab and it costs you $4 million to build your lab, you're going to be giving away more equity than a founder who, um, yeah, yeah, who's doing a SaaS startup that, that is like low capital intensivity. But yeah, I'd say like in that, in that first round, you can maybe give away, it might be like a classic pre-seed raise would be like $4 million or three to $4 million pre-money on a, and a million dollars of cash. And so yeah. that's like, you're giving away 20-ish percent of your company. Yeah. Um, and that should hopefully give you 18 months of runway, lets you validate the idea. Um, but what you really want to do is set yourself, think about like how many rounds of capital do I need to raise and have a capital strategy. And so, yeah, I might give away 20% now and then I'll have to give away another like 10% in my seed and then, or maybe I'll give away 15 and then 15. And then when I get to series A, you probably need 50 to 60% of the company left with the founding or key key team. So it doesn't yep. need to be the founders, but like key key members of the team need to be holding a good chunk because you get into the situation and this happens tons in New Zealand, which is pretty sad um, where founders have just had to give away way too much um, investors, especially like there's certain, all the pro professional investors don't do this. And so like credit to them, but there is like individuals out there who would just take predatory, predatory stakes in startups. Yeah. Um, and it like it sucks because then the founders left with they're like oh I've got twenty percent and my investors got eighty percent and it's, there's no way you can raise capital and all that happens at that point is you have to do a heap of like um, cap table gymnastics to to get VC money and often it's just like the incoming investors would just be like too hard I'm not gonna yeah yeah tell me tell me when you've solved this and come back and and you get this kind of it's a more traditional mindset someone who probably doesn't come from a tech background but is investing um, where they're like well like. You, how can you value your company at two million dollars? It hasn't done anything. Like I'm gonna get, like it's valued at five hundred k, and so I'll give you three hundred k, but I own sixty percent. Like that's completely predatory because you're not valuing a company based on its. It's not based on what the company is worth today. It is based on what it can be in the future, yeah. and you have to set that company up for success and to be able to raise. If it's a VC, it's going on that VC path. It has to be able to raise future rounds of capital. Yeah. So if if you take too much if the vc or like rather an angel or something takes too much equity on day one they've basically set the founder up to fail there or they're gonna mm. have a really tough conversation down the track how do you 
like if someone's listening to this now, I mean, what, how do you value your company like on the back of a napkin? Like what are the numbers that you're talking with them about? Yeah, um, are we talking that really early stage? Yeah. Yeah, so we often lean on something called the Berkus methodology. Um, Berkus, B-E-R-K-U-S. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was a famous uh, US angel investor. And like Mike said, it's having a big financial model which shows that you're going to make a billion dollars revenue in five years time you know like that's Bullshit. at this point it's just rubbish and it's yeah. just it's pointless um because you're going to pivot five times before you even get to a million dollars revenue so like what's the point in this model um the burkus methodology essentially says any pre-revenue especially SaaS company at the highest valuation at this point is worth two and a half million dollars and it breaks it down into five buckets and i can't remember the top of my head what those five buckets are but it's like the founders the market the product yeah. um to others and each of those five you rate out of on a scale of one to five you pro rate out of that bucket of 500k for that and that gives you a, a valuation yeah. and essentially what that's doing is it's saying that the key drivers of value in this business it's not a financial model it's these five key mo- five key pillars mm-hmm. um with the obvious one being the founders and we're willing to go up to two and a half million dollars valuation and so we'll invest 500k at a 2.5 million dollar valuation um and we really like the simplicity in that because at this early stage you can excel can show you anything you can make up whatever you want um you can spin a great story but at the end of the day the best validation of a startup success is going to come down to these five things how big is the market yeah have the founders had success or are they gonna do they show signs that they're gonna succeed yeah um what's their product market fit those sorts of things um that's the really early stage and then as you go through that journey through pre-seed seed seed, series a each of those become more scientific until you're getting to series b series c where it's like is this the inverse and that at that point it's all about due diligence on your financial model showing those unit economics um and it's it's like a it's a it's a you know journey through that pipeline as you go through each stage becoming more scientific yeah. having more data points both historically so it's really important from day one that you're setting yourself up to succeed with these unit economics um and then being able to model that out for the future and being able to show an investor look if we get 10 million dollars we have shown that if we put 5 million of that into marketing that drives these outcomes each acquisition is going to cost us this much money therefore xyz we've got a billion dollar company yeah um and yeah as you go through the journey each of those investment rounds becomes more scientific and less so about the like airy fairy yeah, yeah. <laughs> for those listening i just licked my finger and put it in the air yeah um are you guys like obviously you mentioned MA was your sort of early career is that something that you guys do is that something you, you you're gonna get into yeah so our role in everything we do but this is most obvious and cap raising is we work for our clients we're a part of their team and um and we're helping them raise capital in the same way that an internal part of their team is so we're helping build up financial models we're helping challenge the um, founders on their assumptions we're helping present information in the way that um, investors want to see it um, we're helping push back on pitch decks and get feedback and help feed into that whole process um, what we're not doing is we're not like an investment banker we're not a broker who's going yeah. out facilitating the deal and like taking a percentage cut on a cap raise yeah. we're working as part of the team and I mean we that's a big part of what we do um, not as a like standalone project it's quite infrequent that we'll work with a company and say they'll come to us we want to raise two million dollars we'll do that as a project and see you later yeah. it's all our clients work with us on an ongoing basis and because we're working with over 100 startups we're constantly have clients who are raising capital um, and to put that in perspective um i think in the last three years on average about 30 percent of the early stage capital in new zealand is our clients michael owen has raised over 150 million dollars for his clients um or with shit. his clients shit yeah bro um probably <laughs> my clients have probably raised maybe 100 million um and that's just investor money on top of that we're helping our clients raise or well, not raise capital but bring in non-dilutive capital through um rdti grants and callahan funding and that mm. sort of thing um and so yeah so so we're more involved in the startup space and yeah. in, in the capital raising startup space than probably anyone else in the market 
That's awesome. How much collectively? Let's so say you guys like two hundred and fifty million between you guys. That you yeah. Self raise. Like if you were thinking about oxygen total. That's, it's, we don't know. Exactly. It's one of our things on our list that we like. We need to put this on a website. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but like Mike said, we just don't promote ourselves. Um, it would be probably close to half a billion dollars, I'd say. Yeah, I was thinking like 400 and something million. Um, yeah, half a billion sounds better. Yeah, half yeah, a billion yeah. does sound better. <laughs> edit, half edit a billion. Out, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, awesome. Um, cash is killing at the moment, right? Um, like what, what do you advise people like, hey, what level of runway is safe at the moment, would you say? Uh depends massively on like just the support of investors and how confident you are you're going to raise more capital like if you're not confident you could go out and raise capital at a good multiple you definitely want to stretch it out as long as possible yeah. or even uh, have a have a pathway that if you needed yeah. to you could get to break even yeah. yeah which isn't a nice conversation well, that's a lot of people that have to yeah. do that right yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's not necessarily having that doing it now it's knowing that you can do that before you run out of money yeah, yeah. and then again coming back to like having visibility knowing when you need to pull that trigger and be like hey look we've given this growth a go and if we had grown into it we wouldn't have needed to raise capital or we could have raised capital with good metrics yeah but if the metrics aren't there like you're not going to raise capital at the moment you need to extend that runway and here's plan b yeah. that you need to pull on one september and we all agree now in june that if at one september you haven't either closed this much revenue or your metrics aren't showing this or xyz that you're going to do this restructure and like yeah. remove these four roles or whatever it is yeah, yeah definitely those trigger points is what you want to have like you want to know yeah when do i need to take actions because you don't want to be in that position where it's too late right like if you do have to unfortunately make a re do a restructure or something and everyone has huge leave payouts and you've only got three months of runway well it probably doesn't even make a difference so you may as well keep your team till the end mm. because and the later you leave it, the like more impactful it is. Yeah. Like, you know, you could do a, a three person restructure now. If you leave it three more months, it's going to be a five person. If you leave it seven what months. What do you say to those people? Because a lot of people are like, oh, if I'm the first to restructure, though, the market looks at me, you know, in the spotlight on me. And, I, and I'll say to people exactly that, right? Hey, mm -hmm. if you need to do a three person, five person now, do it. Do yeah. it now. Don't yeah. be scared, right? Like, it's it's only if you, if you think, don't just take a little bite at yeah, it if you know that's what that, you want to avoid yeah. you want to avoid like having to do a three person one now and then another three person one in three months and then another three person one in nine months that's when you kill your culture that's yeah. going to be like culture is just going to be absolutely destroyed yeah um so the flip side of that is it's not saying do a three three person one now and a three person one then it's doing a three person one now so you don't have to do any more yeah. but if you leave it you're gonna have to do a six person one in six months yeah so it's, it's helping understand um just coming back to what I was saying earlier, it's coming it's having visibility on the outcome of your decisions yeah. and knowing is it is having the uh, is making those calls now or later better. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Hey, um if you guys have been following along on this series, you'd know that we're finalizing with a question from the previous guest. And so the question and this one comes to you from one of the happiest men in New Zealand, Simon Pound. So I'm gonna <laughs> ask you each individually, I'll start with you, Mike. And he wanted to know what does success look like for you and i'll frame it if you want and so like it's it could be money it could be this it could be that but like when, when you think about success what does that look like for you yeah it's probably like a pretty corny answer but i've got a young daughter and i've um will have another baby due and definitely like when my daughter nora looks at me i want her to be proud of her dad and i want to be a good dad so that's probably like number one and mm. then uh the second piece probably like what I'm passionate about in the tech space and what we've been talking about for the last hour or so is um, just how many companies we can help, how much how much impact we can have. Um, yeah, I mean, like money hopefully comes alongside of it and, yeah. and that kind of thing, but it's definitely like, that's what drives me. That's what I'm excited about. And that's why, yeah, that's what's different about working here versus a big corporate is that I'm excited to come in and do that every day. And that that's, yeah, like I feel like every day I'm on the path to doing something that's my purpose it's how i kind of found my um my thing i guess yeah awesome man awesome what about yourself man yeah i mean obviously those as well um and then i mean our purpose at oxygen our mission statement is creating the new zealand economy of tomorrow yeah and so creating the new zealand economy of tomorrow yeah, yeah i like that and so um historically the biggest exports in new zealand have been dairy and tourism um and well dairy first then tourism and probably anecdotally houses unfortunately yeah. which i think sucks tech is actually 
it was the third biggest export of New Zealand. And I think, since, well, definitely over COVID, it overtook tourism. Yep. I'm not sure where it sits now. But it's on track to become the, the biggest uh, exporter of New Zealand by 2030 or 2035. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's awesome. Like taking the, what tech exporting is, is it's taking the smarts out of our smartest people, putting it into code and selling that to the world. And how much better is that than milking a cow yeah. and you know selling dairy products? Helping these companies become the zeros and the vens and the the you know success stories of tomorrow, helping them go from that really early stage where they're still learning their way and they're trying to figure out what all this means and how to do that and help them accelerate from that to the zeros. Like that's for me the biggest purpose. We look back on how much capital we've raised, how many high value jobs that's created in New Zealand and the impact that's having on the New Zealand economy. Like for us that's super exciting that we can have such a big impact on it. And we look back at what we've managed to do so far. Like we have, like I've mentioned, we've, we've got about 100 clients that are active now, but we've worked with probably over 200. Um, and there's all the classic stats around 90% um, of startups fail. 70% of those fail in years one to five, which is our sort of sweet spot. Um, and looking back at the clients we've worked with, only three percent of our companies have of our clients have closed down, and there's all sorts of impacts on that. But if we can be part of the solution that reduces a ninety percent failure rate to a three percent failure rate, like that's us creating value for New Zealand and, and doing that, what we do. That's fucking ridiculous. Like three yeah. percent of your companies have failed in that first five years. That's yeah. huge. Yeah. Man, that, that, that makes me happy. It makes me feel <laughs> successful. What would you like to ask the next guest? Like, what's the question that you would want to know without knowing who it may be? What's something you believe that other people, like that's not a commonly held belief? What's something where you're, uh, you go against the grain? I love that question. That's one of my favorite interview questions. Yeah. Yeah. What's your answer? Uh, maybe if we pick like in the tech sphere, like not everyone should raise VC money. Like yep. that's probably like classic one. Everyone just goes and thinking oh yeah i'll just raise capital and like that's that's what everyone does yeah there's some really awesome companies that have just done it a different different way and like you actually should make the decision based on what you want to achieve and what makes sense um yeah. so awesome. that's one yeah controversial i yeah. I, I, th I think but i'll get i'll let you get away with that <laughs> what about you man who do you surround yourself and how do you surround yourself with people that helps you balance um running a tech startup if they're running a tech startup or running their business with having a family or friends or life outside of it um, because for me personally that's probably been the biggest challenge i've had is finding balance do and you, do you have that now yeah 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 and one of them in fact is dan buchanan from town yeah. so um i catch up with dan and another guy abraham once a month um yeah. all three of us have been business owners or are business owners shit he just got married too eh? yeah Abe, yeah yep and um and for us that's like a really safe forum to be able to be like man this is tough like yeah what what would you do in this situation um and then on top of that i've just had a network that i've built up over the time of people that i know who to call when yeah when stuff's when yeah when stuff's really hard awesome i think everyone needs it hey like i think because like the whole do you raise or do you not raise right that's really pertinent at the moment right everyone's like well i think we're going to get these product-led growth you know like sales driven startups again now that are going to have great opportunities to build businesses really fast just you know just getting on and doing it right and mm -hmm. so yeah it's um but the the market says if you don't raise vc you know you're not a successful startup and yeah, so surround yeah, yourself with good people and all those benchmarks and stuff all the stuff like we look at and all the reporting says like that's all based on those companies and so you actually have to think about your whole company in a different light if you if that's your path yeah. yeah hey guys well that was awesome that was a that was a really really cool chat i just want to finalize by saying like i shit you not i hear about you guys all the time and i live in wellington right like it's you know like the ecosystem reps you guys hard like i dan and i are massive advocates of you guys anytime you know we can intro you we do um it's hard being a services business behind the ecosystem, doing it with integrity, doing it well, because you know, like you're balancing your values with like raising revenue and doing all these things and you're doing it behind the scenes, pushing your clients into the spotlight. And so from the industry, thank you guys. We, you know, we acknowledge it and appreciate you. I look forward to seeing the, the next wave now yeah. um, of yeah. oxygen. And yeah, like guys for the Awesome. Yeah. Cheers for coming on guys. Thank, thank you. you. Awesome. I hope you enjoyed that financial podcast there of accountants, uh, virtual CFOs, and the absolute 
good guys of the industry or good guys guys and girls you know as i'm sitting with a whole bunch of 30 of them here they are such amazing people to work with oxygen we've worked with them for many many years they're similar to us in talent army in that they do so much behind the scenes with the startup ecosystem that you don't necessarily hear about them as often as you should and so i really wanted to get them on and help them tell their story because they like what was it 500 million dollars that they've helped raise for the SaaS ecosystem and i think they're only just scratching the surface i think they're with their growth into australia i think with all the skills and battle scars that they have now they're only going to help you more so if you don't know who they are or if you need potentially to go off and have a look into them go down below we've got their website there you can go off and check them out and then bolt them onto your business and hopefully raise hundreds of millions of dollars for the new zealand startup ecosystem thanks for joining Really love you to, while you're going down to check out those Oxygen Advisor links, please give us a follow or a subscribe, whatever platform you're watching or listening to now, because you're the best. We appreciate you. You're the ones that show us the love and we thank you and you're the reason why we keep doing these podcasts. Until next week, I'm Troy. See you then. This podcast is produced by Jono Tucker from Empire Films.